Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence with psychiatrist Bernard David Beitman, MD. Dr. Beitman is the founder of The Coincidence Project. The project encourages people like you to tell each other coincidence stories. To learn more about Dr. Beitman's work, put Connecting with Coincidence in your web browser. You'll find his book, his Psychology Today blog, and the interviews from this podcast. And now your host, Bernard Beitman, MD. Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence. I am your host, Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD. Uh, I study the mind and the brain in its physical and cultural context and trying to figure out how those things work together. There's something about mind, brain, and environment that we're having to learn more and more about that, that is very important for us in the future of humanity. I've got a new book coming out. It's coming out September 3rd, September 6th now, and it's called Meaningful Coincidences, and uh, it's how and why synchronicity and serendipity happen. You can pre-order it at the link below, uh, but it'll be out pretty soon. So this is a story uh, happened to me recently, and, and put it in a Psychology Today post if you want to see more ab about the background of it. It's called On Hearing Voices. Uh, I was sitting among the trees along the river here in Charlottesville, uh, wondering whether I should go right or left. Uh, to, right, was to the, right was to the parking lot, left was to an open space where there was a Ravenna River Company, and I don't know what was happening there. So I said, what am I going to do, go right or left? And the thunder was getting louder, so rain was going to happen. So a voice, <clears throat> a voice came to me. I heard a voice. It was from outside of me. And the voice said, go left. I said, what? Go left. So I said to the voice, why? And the voice said, you'll see. So I went left. I went left, and yeah, I started to hear some music. Great, I was ready to do some dancing. Someone was doing a sound check on the outdoor stage. It was Devin Spruill, a singer-songwriter that had been wanting to see, but had yet to see her. She was going to open the first set. However, the ticket person told me that the concert was sold out, so I was left to linger outside the fence to listen. Then a woman came over to me offering a ticket. The ticket taker had told her that I wanted to get in, and the woman had an extra ticket, so okay, so she gave me the ticket. I met her husband and the three of us had a great time together. So we went out to dinner the following week. As our dinner ended, they asked me if I wanted to have a party to celebrate the publication of my new book. Well, I've been trying to think about how to publicize this book in Charlottesville, my hometown, and here was the opening given to me. So I'd wanted to hear Devin Spruill, and there she was, and I wanted some help in trying to publicize my book in Charlottesville, there it was. So I did see what the voice had suggested. I did see something. I listened to that voice. And there are other people who hear voices and they're not so problematic. You might look at my Psychology Today post on that subject. Our guest today is Dr. Eben Alexander. Dr. Alexander, <laughs> spent 54 years of his life honing a conventional scientific worldview, including teaching neurosurgery at Harvard Medical School for 15 years. His profound near-death experience during a week-long coma due to gram-negative bacterial meningitis, meno, meno, meningioencephalitis in November 2008, in which the medical parameters obviated all but the most rudimentary of conscious experiences, changed his worldview from materialism, that is the brain creates consciousness, to idealism, acknowledging the primacy and unity of consciousness in the universe, while the brain's serving as a filter to limit the expression of that primordial mind. He works with science around the world to more fully explain these phenomena. Welcome to the show, Evan. I Bernie, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me back on again. Oh, so good to see you. It's so good to see you. You're looking wonderful. And it's so good to be able to hear how you think and how your thinking is evolving over the, since the last time we talked in one of these podcasts. And in one of these podcasts before, you, to, you told me an incredible story about 
your birth family, you had been adopted. And uh, why don't you tell us about it? And this time we're going to take it further and you're going to tell us what it means to you about how things work. Okay, well, thank you for uh, reintroducing that because to me, that's one of the most powerful and amazing synchronicities of my entire uh, life and existence. Um, and uh, I think uh, uh, important to point out to people that this has a lot to do with the fact that I was adopted. I was put up for adoption when I, I was 11 days old. Uh, and in many ways, I think that was a huge driver for my NDE because uh, in many ways, by being put up for adoption by my birth mother, I really, uh, uh, you know, would question my reason for existence. I mean, it really is a, a deep challenge. So anyway, uh, but to get to the, the heart of the synchronicity story about that adoption history, uh, important to point out that uh, I, I was adopted into a fa the family of a, of a neurosurgeon. He was a globally renowned neurosurgeon and uh, he was very scientific, uh, but he also had very strong uh, religious beliefs. He used prayer and his, his uh, you know, surgical healing of patients and things like that. He fully believed in the power of prayer and healing. And uh, for him, it was easy. For me, it was a real challenge growing up in the 60s and 70s. Um, so anyway, uh, I always knew that science was the pathway to truth and followed in my father's footsteps. So, but I, I couldn't really follow in the same footsteps that allowed for that spiritual wisdom and uh, awareness that he had. Uh, and that's why this synchronicity, I think, is kind of important to me, and especially the way my understanding of it has evolved over the last few years. And it starts with the fact that uh, in, in my life, uh, uh, when I was in my uh, 20s, you know, I was in medical school, I was trying to decide what to go into. Uh, and of course, neurosurgery was the obvious choice, because that's what my father did. And that's what attracted me to medicine originally was his work. But I also thought in the back of my mind that I would always compare myself with his career. And so I thought, well, I'll go to medical school, but I won't go into neurosurgery. That was kind of the way I went. But then in medical school, I did a neurosurgical rotation and realized, oh, my gosh, this is it. I love this. And that, that was my chosen field from that point forward. Uh, in 1980, I finished medical school, started my residency at Duke. But that also involved a two-year uh, stint in the laboratory and also doing neurology up at Mass General Hospital in Boston. Uh, and this is where, in the mid-80s, I was making this big decision, what part of neurosurgery do I want to go into? And I was fascinated with vascular neurosurgery, with going after aneurysms and arteriovenous malformations. There's something about the technical challenges of that. Uh, I, I just like the demands of it. it. It's kind of the extreme of neurosurgery because your patients are doing great one day and the next day they have their hemorrhage and they're close to death. Uh, and so it really demands intense effort on our part uh, to do them the service of trying to bring them back to health. So that's what I did mid eighties, uh, did two years of research in a particular aspect of vascular neurosurgery called vasospasm. Um, and uh, then ended up doing a fellowship in England in 1987 uh, on clipping aneurysms and, and being a vascular neurosurgeon. I mean, that was my big giant focus was taking care of people with aneurysms. Uh, so it turns out that imagine my surprise when years later, uh, when I discovered uh, in, in the year 2000 was actually when this happened was, uh, uh, you know, I've, to I've told the story many times before how I'd looked for my birth family back in my uh, teens and early 20s and, and had finally given up on that, just decided that my birth mother wasn't looking for me, so forget about it. Uh, and then it turns out that in the year 2000, um, my son, um, older son, Evan IV, had a school project in family genealogy, and he said, we need to know more about your birth family. So I wrote a letter to the children's home. I expect to get the same old answer I'd always gotten. Your mother's not looking for you, so forget about her. But that's not the answer I got. As I report in the book Proof of Heaven, uh, I found out that my birth uh, mother and father actually got married. That was giant news to me in the year 2000. I never suspected they'd gotten together. And not only that, they had three children. And of course, that is the backstory for a lot of what happens in Proof of Heaven and the surprise about that. But the interesting thing that I didn't really share in the book so much was why that knowledge was available to me in the year 2000. And it has to do with the fact that back in the mid-1960s, 
my maternal birth father had a subarachnoid hemorrhage from an aneurysm, was in coma for months, probably saw my father as a consultant before he died. Um, so anyway, that happened back in the mid 60s. And that was my birth family, uh, maternal grandfather. Uh, and then fast forward uh, uh, years later, 1978, my birth mother's youngest sister, Wanda, ended up having a subarachnoid hemorrhage from an aneurysm that killed her. She died, I think it was Halloween day, 1978. Uh, and so you have these two subarachnoid hemorrhages in the family. And the good news is that my birth sister, Kathy, who I had not yet met, I had no idea, I didn't meet her until 2008. But anyway, she knew that these things could be hereditary. Uh, she knew I, she had heard, and this, I don't want to get into the depth of the story. It's a fascinating story. But she knew because of a family spat between my birth mother and her own mother that I existed. The, the birth mother had kind of put that piece of information out to my younger sister, who didn't know of my existence at all, that she had a brother out there. And, and of course, she couldn't ask the family. Nobody would tell her the story and confirm that, yes, there had been a birth brother out there. But she assumed it was true. She actually had a private investigator who found me, identified me. All those kind of things happened. But the reality is that Kathy took it on herself to protect me by sending information to the children's home, telling them there was a family history of subarachnoid hemorrhage and that I need to be aware of that so I could protect myself. I didn't find that out till 2000. And that was a gigantic surprise because you know this is 15, 20 years after I'd made all my decisions about going into cerebrovascular surgery. So to find out that I now had this birth family and I actually reconnected with them in uh, 2007, uh, but the only way that connection could be made was because we had this biological predisposition to subarachnoid hemorrhage and that my birth sister, Kathy, who I didn't meet until 2008, took it on herself to protect me by passing that information about subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, back to me. And uh, to me, that kind of uh, connection across the decades of uh, birth family predisposition, something I knew absolutely zero about, and yet... I was driven uh, you know, to go into neurosurgery and not only that, but to pursue cerebrovascular neurosurgery and addressing aneurysms, taking people, care of people with uh, vascular lesions of the brain. That was my chosen field of interest. And to find out 15, 20 years later that I had this uh, biological predisposition and that that was actually the reason I could connect with my birth family, to me, was an astonishing set of kind of synchronistic uh, connections. Astonishing, uh, <laughs> astonishing, and uh, the 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 web of detail that allowed this to happen because your birth sister wanted to protect you. What love there was in her to be able to do that for you, and that how your birth mother kept you as a secret and had you had to be found out. And there are more. There's I'm sure there's more more intrigue here in this story than you're telling us but you had a, a, a grandfather who had had an aneurysm and then you had uh, a sister who had an, an aunt. it would be an, an aunt. aunt an yeah, aunt who had birth mother's sister right birth mother's sister who had the aneurysm so this was all on your birth mother's side the, right. the, the the genetics of the aneurysm in the family right and, and it turns out there was another her other sister uh, because Barbara, my birth mother had two sisters. The other one had a subarachnoid hemorrhage in 2004 uh, and was wrecked, put into coma for months, uh, took several years to recover, but ended up making such a full recovery. And I met her after that hemorrhage. I met her when she started this incredible recovery. Normally after two years, you don't expect a lot of recovery, but that's when my aunt's uh, recovery really started, was around the time I met her two years out. And her recovery, she went back to winning golf tournaments. I mean, it was absolutely astonishing uh, how much she recovered. But that subarachnoid hemorrhage was a giant part of our family history by pretty much affecting everybody in my birth mother's family. Your aunt who recovered, you correlated her recovery with your meeting her. I, I can't help thinking there's a little magic going on there. 
Well, I won't claim that. All I, <laughs> uh, because in fact, I would not credit. You know, I I believe in prayer, and I prayed a lot for her recovery. And but I don't know how much that had to do with it. I actually think. Uh, she uh, encountered a, a healer who was more open-minded to uh, kind of non-Western alternative healing. And I think he helped her uh, uh, get to where she uh, ended up getting. But to me, the amazing thing was she had had that hemorrhage, I think it was in 2004. And I didn't meet that whole family until 2007. And she had already started this kind of accelerated recovery, I would say, when I came into the picture. So I'm not trying to claim credit for that. But the interesting thing is she ended up having a far richer, more complete recovery very late in the game, you know, beyond that two year time point after a stroke, you usually don't expect a lot, but well, well, sure benefit. That's a magical, that's, that's an unexpected outcome. And we're talking about the unexpected happening. That's part of what uh, coincidences and synchronicity are about. And so there's a, how about your pre, your predisposition to have an aneurysm yourself? Well, uh, I mean, it's there because I've got this huge family history, but I've had, uh, um, you know, I've had uh, MR angiography just to show that I don't have an aneurysm as of, you know, about four years ago. And I'll probably get that monitored about every uh, 10 years or so. But right now I, I know that the, uh, the MRI angiogram does not show me to have an aneurysm. All right. It's there. So, well, as I, I mean, you have to be thinking about it. Um, right, my, sure. my father, my father uh, died of a hepatic artery aneurysm. So I'm, oh, okay. I'm, I'm, fa I'm familiar with tracking aneurysm histories. Not that there is anybody else who had it, but the important thing here is that uh, you, Eben Alexander, um, decided to be a neurosurgeon, which your uh, birth with your adopted father was was a neurosurgeon. Right. So that was a predisposition already for you to go into that field. But right. then you just glommed on to doing uh, aneurysm surgery. Right. Vascular. That was it. And that, that was my big focus. That was your big focus. So we didn't really get to in our last interview about how you think that happened, that you <sighs> vascular surgery, brain aneurysm, I got to do this and I'm going to go far and wide to figure out how to do it i'll do research in it uh, i'm going to harvard where uh, hopefully there's some good guys who are doing it and yeah. i'm going to come the best i can at uh, at doing this um aneurysm surgery uh brain uh, this uh, brain aneurysm surgery so how did that happen do you think well i can tell you that once i kind of started connecting these dots i realized that uh, my you know certainly my prior prior to coma materialist neuroscientist view of the world was completely false, uh, you know, because I was seeing elements of connection that have absolutely no uh, way of existing in a materialist kind of causal chain of, uh, you know, A, then B, then C. Uh, there was no way to connect those dots in that kind of standard materialist way. Uh, this was, uh, you know, deep and profound. There was no way you could be talking about, uh, um, really any of the standard modes of information acquisition I would normally think of. That's, that's what made me realize this is a beautiful example of how uh, the major elements of our lives are connected behind the surface appearance of things in very fascinating ways. I mean, it really, for me, it gets right at the heart of what is so absolutely astonishing of, in, in the gift of synchronicities and, and meaningful coincidences. I think these are very profound indicators of our connection with a universe that is just rich with meaning and with purpose and with understanding, but we simply need to open our minds to it and be able to uh, kind of openly uh, address all the pieces of this patchwork quilt so that we can kind of recognize patterns that uh, in many ways are kind of unprecedented to us. And I yes. think that's really yes. the challenge. That's it's the challenge is seeing those patterns acknowledging that the universe in many ways is giving us a wink and a nudge and uh, here's your connection. So uh, to me, it was, that was just astonishing uh, well, to start putting all those pieces together. Well, I, I did a little dissecting in my first year in medical school. So, and you have to, you had to do a lot of that because you had to yeah. get to where you needed to get to in, uh, in the brain. So dissect for us the pathway between your going in to vascular surgery and 
the universe uh, pattern recognition, it's all connected. What, what, dissect the connection between us, please. Well, that's that's where it gets to me. I mean, the best way to kind of explain and make sense of this is really just to adopt uh, the view of, you know, that we are souls and that our souls come back uh, in multiple incarnations. Our souls have meaning and purpose and that uh, the most important thing to know about our souls is that they have deep and profound relationships with other souls and that we use that uh, kind of deep sense of connection to learn and teach each other about the fundamental nature of the universe. So in other words, it, it demanded you know, a complete reworking of my notion of the fundamental nature of reality and of, of how events can be related to other events. And in many ways necessitated that I take this much grander view uh, that would see my, you know, my uh, soul journey involving that in this lifetime that I would work in neurosurgery, that would be my field, my interest, my, my passion, uh, and, and yet have it tied into my existence in a much deeper way. Uh, to where, you know, at some point in the game, I'd come to realize the, all these connections and go, oh my gosh, how come? How did this happen? Uh, but really taking that much bigger view, and it's one that, that really needs to open up to a certain kind of, uh, uh, I would say, determinism and planning. And when I say that, uh, I would say that uh, part of my understanding with this bigger notion of soul and multiple incarnations and having purpose in life um, was acknowledging this, uh, this set of connections around the aneurysm history, uh, the personal history of that, and how crucial it was for me to actually reconnect to my birth family. Uh, and then, of course, there's so many other elements of the story. As you mentioned earlier, this is a really deep story, and I don't want to wander off in all these random directions away from it. But <clears throat> even the way that... Um, uh, Kathy found out about my existence. That's the birth sister who uh, uh, sent all that information to the children's home. Uh, and the fact that it had to do with a, 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 a spat between her mother and her grandmother, you know, uh, and that the grandmother kind of got back at the mother by sharing this little tidbit of information that, oh, you know, they, they adopted a baby boy back when they were teenagers. And Kathy said, well, grandma, I don't think that uh, that would really be allowed by social services in North Carolina in the early 50s. And she said, oh, you know what I mean. They had a baby boy and put him up for adoption. And then she stomped away. And by dropping that bombshell into the family dynamic, informing my sister of this deep secret that my birth mother and father thought nobody else in the universe knew. Uh, I mean, that's what started this incredible chain of events. And that was back in 1987. So interesting that Kathy found out about my existence in August of 87. And that's basically, I'd now been through three or four years of, you know, working in the lab and aiming myself directly into vascular neurosurgery. And in fact, in August of 87, when Kathy found out uh, about my existence uh, at that, that same time, I was actually uh, on a plane with my uh, pregnant uh, former spouse uh, going to have our first child born in Northern England, where I was going to be doing a fellowship in cerebrovascular surgery. So, I mean, the, the temporal kind of connections, the big things going on at different levels here, to me, it's all just fascinating. But well, you're, you're, was, you're able to see yourself in a web that you weren't able to see before. Exactly. And that's the beautiful thing is you, in looking back, you can see all these connections and these things that were working together. And you couldn't see them at the time, but in many ways, they were all conspiring to teach me some incredibly deep lessons about the nature of reality. You know, and as a Harvard neurosurgeon, you know, with 15 uh, years of experience teaching at Harvard about neurosurgery and consciousness and the brain and the mind, I thought I had some idea about how all that worked, but I was woefully ignorant uh, until my coma, which really awakened me to the true grand scale of this universe and the beauty of these kind of interconnections. And the and the, it, it also, uh, you know, I gained a tremendous amount of trust in the universe with my NDE, that there are forces that uh, are very benevolent and loving and supportive of our efforts. And that's something that's helped me tremendously, uh, tremendously in my time since then. But that uh, that trust, uh, in many ways, is greatly uh, uh, enhanced by this kind of recognition in retrospect of how all these factors were working together to kind of help me come into knowing 
about all this. And, it's, and th they were done for you or the, so, the, so, the soul that is you. The, the soul that is me uh, greatly appreciates the benefit that the universe has offered me with these kind of synchronistic messages. And the gratitude in you is just bursting out of you as you're telling me this story. Absolutely. I mean, you know, when you think about my story, how can you have anything but gratitude with every breath you take? I mean, really, every bit of it is just pure gravy. Uh, and that includes my entire life before coma, too. And, and just, you know, it's great to be given that in your life is a beautiful sense of the, the wondrous mystery of it all and, and the benevolence of the universe and how much love is there to really take care of us and, and be with us uh, in spite of all the apparent travails and hardships and challenges of this world. Uh, at its deepest core, that spiritual element of the universe is very loving and friendly and uh, you know, there for our benefit. You know, we're loving souls. The more we can bring this love into the world, the more that loving aspect of the universe just flows all over us. And that's in, what I've seen. In the early years of your trying to figure out how to get your message out after your NDE, uh, I had the pleasure and opportunity to hear you speak at the Division of Perceptual Study a couple of times and describe some of the, some of the amazing things that seemed to happen while you were in this coma, while you were out there. But one of the things that struck me so much was the, the intensity, degree, I don't know, have a good adjective, of love that you were experiencing around you. Right. It, it, you were immersed in love. Well, absolutely. And in so many ways, I mean, just remember that adoption story. And, and, you know, I was put up for adoption at age 11 days. That's very early. But the challenge was my birth mother, she was unwed, 16 years old. Uh, and the social workers basically kind of absconded with me over the, the Christmas holidays in 1953-54. And uh, so that's the way she had, quote, given me up. But she was unwilling to sign the papers to actually let me get adopted. So it was kind of a catch-22. I was in this limbo state because uh, I ended up spending four months in a baby dorm waiting to be adopted because she wouldn't let me go. And yet she let me go from her. So uh, and, and that, you know. I couldn't have been more fortunate. I'm not looking for anybody's pity because I went, I was adopted into a wonderful, loving family, uh, you know, three beautiful sisters, a mother and father who loved me so much, honored all my hopes and dreams. I mean, I couldn't have asked for more. I couldn't have been more blessed. But the reality is my, my father, the neurosurgeon, would always tell me, you cannot remember things that happened in your life when you were, you know, days, weeks, a month or two old. We don't remember those things. But he was wrong. We do remember, and we remember it in a very deep kind of pre-linguistic way, and that's what makes those memories so absolutely challenging to get at. If you have trauma in those very early, you know, weeks of life, uh, it's very difficult to kind of get at that. And and for much of my life, uh, there was this struggle deep inside me. Uh, it wasn't you know at a conscious ego level, but deep inside that I wasn't even worthy of love because I'd been given away by my birth mother. In fact, I went on a hunger strike and was hospitalized for failure to thrive. That was part of the setup for the social workers to take me away from my birth mother uh, without you know her fully endorsing that plan of action because uh, they. She, I'd been hospitalized, and then she then went home for the holidays. And by the time she came back looking for me, I was gone uh, to the children's home. And there's more, and I know there's more. Uh, if this, there's a, there, there is you, this, a soul who's connected to other souls that right. somehow helped reveal to you what you needed to be able to do in your life uh, as directed by the birth family's genetic history uh, and I, I without uh, asking you any more about that i my opinion of what happened uh, how you got to doing aneurysms surgery was that somewhere in your being there was knowledge of this history in the family right. it had it had to be there because it had already been there so in this little infant that was on a hunger strike from his mother was still the information buried in him that the family had a problem with the aneurysm 
uh, genetically. And then somehow what? He gets put into a family of neurosurgeon, a neurosurgeon. What right. What a thing that was, uh, because that's going to direct you. And with that seed of information in you, in that neurosurgical space, you connected with what was already in you and were able to put it together in a way that really hit your passion because right. it connected you to that birth family and to so much more. That's my, that's well, my. I, I would say that certainly is, is a reasonable interpretation of the data, but it's that somehow, you know, that, that word that uh, is really supporting so much that we really just don't understand. And yet it's such an elaborate and kind of a, uh, very strong set of connections. And also in, in, in my own world, I, I remember so much about my struggles about that. You know, when I started uh, college, I wanted to go into astrophysics, but then I, I spent a summer working in the hospital, really loved working with patients, came to realize why my dad loved it so much, uh, then decided on medical school, uh, but knew I would, no way I was going to go into neurosurgery. That was you know, I wasn't going to compete with him in the back of my mind. I want to do something else in medicine, but it wouldn't be neurosurgery. But then when I did that rotation, I went, oh, my gosh, he was right. This stuff is fantastic. And that's what I'm, that's what I mean. There was a recognition in you. And we can say yeah, somehow was it was a recognition of something in you. Yeah. And that recognition, and we can talk about how we can guess. We don't know. But that's my view of looking to you. But there's there's the soul connection that you're talking about. And as we both know, um, the human organism is trashing this planet. And we are making a big mess of our lives, not only our lives, but also the lives of uh, all living beings on this planet. And you carry a message of hope and uh, positivity about the future of, of us on the planet. I wonder if you could tell us about that. Well, yeah, I, I'd say certainly one thing I've come to realize after my NDE, especially in these decade, this decade and a half of work, um, is that, um, you know, this materialist model of thinking, and here I'm talking about uh, kind of scientific materialism and the, or physicalism, the notion that only the physical world exists and therefore the brain must somehow create consciousness uh, out of physical matter. And it's all random. And it's all random, right. That, or, or just let's say it's chemical reactions, electron fluxes, laws of physics, chemistry, biology, but in no way can you inject free will into that circumstance. Good. And materialist neuroscience would pretend, would laugh at you if you claim to have free will. Uh, but in fact, I would say this more quantum informed version of reality, yes, of course we have free will. That's what shapes the evolution of the entire universe or sentient beings. But getting back to your question, uh, what I came to realize is that that materialism gives us a false sense of separation and uh, that we have separate objects. You know, reductive materialism is all about breaking the world down into separate parts, figuring how they interact, and then saying, well, that will give us the recipe for determining what's going to happen in the future. Uh, and of course, uh, that's not really the way it works because free will is a very active part of this. And our, we're really only witnessing our perceptions, not some objective physical world out there. Uh, but, but the hallmark of the problem is this uh, kind of addiction to a thinking of separate objects. And I would say that in the, also in the context of the debates in the 20th century about Darwinian evolution and survival of the fittest. Uh, and I think it was a very misguided uh, kind of cul-de-sac we went into back there in the mid 20th century about competition, you know, and out competing all other life forms and that that meant that was biological success. And what I saw was that collaboration and cooperation were much more important across the, the, the whole animal and plant kingdom much more so than this uh, sense of competition. And I think that they just got it wrong <clears throat> because of that misinterpretation of Darwinian evolution and this continued focus on isolated beings that are separate from each other as a fundamental concept. And then we just lost it. We don't realize, I mean, one thing NDEs teach you is we're all in this together. NDEers have life reviews. Those have been described going back thousands of years across all cultures, belief systems. 
And the life review, interestingly enough, is often described as not just from your own perspective, but from the emotional perspective of those around you who are affected by your uh, actions and even your thoughts. So the life review kind of reveals that the boundaries of self are not really there and that in, we're sharing the dream of the one mind, that we're all truly in this together. And Could so you say that again about how are we affect each other? Because uh, in it, other that's words, so important. the life review is not from your own, you know, soul perspective. The life review is often described as uh, from the emotional perspective of those around us who are affected by our thoughts and actions. So in other words, the life review is your glimpse into the reality that you're sharing the dream of the one mind and that there's an overlap of, of kind of your mind and others. That's why you can experience and feel what it felt like to them to be treated by the way you treated them. So oh, beautiful. Words, Be it's, so it's you, can, self you can feel what it felt like for them to be treated by the way you treated right. them. It's, uh, it's, it's a beautiful way of show. I mean, I, and life reviews also show us that given the detail and complexity and richness of the experiencing, it's not just a remembering of events, it's a reliving of events. I think that's an important thing for people to get. Having been to that realm, which is much more real than this world, sooner or later, the scientific community will have to admit, okay, if these are not hallucinations and confabulations and kind of dreams, uh, then what are they? And what are they showing us about other potential realms of reality? Uh, and that's where we need to take that seriously. And that's why I'm fascinated by driving mechanisms. How do we drive things like NDEs? Is there a way to do that through meditation? Uh, you know, people... Evan, Evan, I'm going to, I'm, uh -huh. I, I, I'm a, I'm a psychotherapist and I'm, I'm still fascinated with your description of a life review, which I was mistaken about because I thought it was like running a movie of what had happened. What you're describing was your life review is an interpersonal review in which you get to experience other people's experience of you. Now, it's, uh, that's true, but it's important to point out that a, a major uh, kind of avenue for my coming into this knowledge was had to do with the fact that during my NDE, I was amnesic for the life of Evan Alexander. I had no uh, memory of my personal life. I had no knowledge of, of earth, humans, language, etc. It was an empty slate. And only months after the event did it become clear to me why that might be of value in my particular NDE. Um, but, but the interesting thing is that amnesia set the stage for the entire NDE to unfold in a way that could not include an Evan Alexander life review, but I saw life reviews and reincarnation in these two fantastic visions I had. Uh, and these were things that were, uh, you know, I knew about from my experience, but it took me several years to unravel. Uh, so even when I gave that talk at UVA uh, that you, you attended back in uh, 2010, um, you know, I was not yet able to make sense of these visions, but the first one was what I call the flying fish vision. And there it was, we were like fish down in the water and material realm, dumbed down, not knowing what our higher souls know. And then of course, when we die, we go up in the air and as flying fish, going up in the air means going back into the time between lives. And that's where we come back into connection with our higher souls, soul groups, plan next incarnations, and then dive back in. So that was a flying fish version. But then in a later uh, transition through the core realm, uh, as I describe in the book, Proof of Heaven, uh, in a later uh, transition, there was this Indra's net vision. And that was absolutely astonishing. And that one was really mysterious. It took me a long time to figure out. But it showed this network of interwoven threads. And I remember they all had this kind of silvery and golden uh, look to them. And they were interwoven, showing our, our lifetimes. You know, and it was almost like breathing, you know, incarnation between lives, incarnation between lives, these beautiful threads. But I could see them all leading towards this golden center of basically Christ consciousness of 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 the evolution and transformation of all of sentience uh, in this fantastic uh, vision I had. Uh, now, when I first came back to this world and, you know, my memories were gone Um initially waking up in that ICU bed, didn't even recognize my mother, my sisters, my sons at the bedside, but memories came back very rapidly, literally language over hours, childhood memories over days, all my semantic knowledge over about two months. Um, but it was, uh, 
you know, it was just this extraordinary experience to have all that kind of come back to me uh, in that in that fashion. And especially in this kind of uh, setting, the the uh, Ender's Net version showed me very clearly uh, kind of reincarnation, life reviews. It showed how they serve as a course correction that allow us to then uh, plan that next incarnation in terms of hardships, difficulties, and challenges. And it's how we deal with those that I think is really the greatest sign of our kind of free will and how it allows for growth from those hardships uh, and the difficulties in life. But it's this much bigger uh, kind of vision uh, that I had to develop. And of course, uh, my early thinking on this was supported by my neurosurgical thinking uh, because I was still kind of between both worlds and I would default to, well, I guess, given the data I was gaining about the disease of my neocortex, all, all the lobes of my brain affected, brainstem infected, uh, this all came out in the medical case report on my medical records in uh, Journal of Nervous and Mental Disease, September 2018. So they went far beyond just my, my report of events. But uh, all that information helps you to realize that to have any kind of experience uh, during this documented damage to my brain is really remarkable. And to have the most extraordinary, detailed, memorable uh, set of um, experiences I've ever had in my life when my brain was so demonstrably offline, that's why you know a lot of people in the scientific community take my story very seriously. But it all kind of boils back to this notion of the one mind that we share. Uh, and that's where I would say this revolution in understanding of consciousness uh, and the oneness of mind, this objective idealism, and the fact that we're all part of that and that indie ears will tell us treat others with the love and respect that you would like to be treated with because that's what you discover when you leave this world uh, is very important. You know, how much love you were able to handle, hand out to others. And that is what will lead us away from that dark abyss of the bleak and paltry fiction of materialist thought that when you, you know, you exist birth to death, nothing more. When you die, it's lights out and the end of conscious awareness. But no, that's not the way it works. There's a much deeper and richer truth to all this. And and you know well from your work with DOPS, the, all the supportive evidence for reincarnation uh, over more than six decades of scientific work. Uh, this is all headed somewhere very uh, fascinating. And to me, that fascinating place is uh, to fully come to accept in a scientific sense uh, this uh, loving, benevolent presence at the heart of the universe, at the heart of our very conscious awareness, that we need to uh, kind of rebirth into uh, our modern culture and society uh, to rescue ourselves from the terrible hazards of this false sense of separation that comes from materialist thought. Because it's like us. corporate <laughs> greed, uh, you know, climate change from uh, energy companies, addiction to fossil fuels, all these things uh, need to be kind of revisited with this higher soul perspective where we're in this together. Yes, corporate greed, nationalism, fundamentalism, and materialism are yeah. four four of the things that you are addressing. How are you getting your message out to people because one of the problems that I find in psychotherapy is people don't change unless they decide to change. We have that free will capacity. And there's a lot of people out there who say, no, we want to have things just the way they are right now. Okay, I'll answer that in just a minute. I just have to take about a three minute break, my rental coffee. I'll be right back. So welcome back, Evan. Well, thanks. Good to be back. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a beautiful question. And uh, uh, what I see happening is actually a pretty uh, fantastic revolution in the scientific community around the nature of consciousness. Uh, and I think a, lo a lot of the books uh, that have come out, I, I know when we were in a um, Karen and I were presenting in Belgium at a neuroscience conference back in 2018, and one of their scientists got up and, and, and showed a graph, basically a PubMed search on of scientific papers studying near-death experiences since 1980. And what they showed was in around 2012, when Proof of Heaven came out, there was a four-fold increase in the annual number of papers of, written on near-death experiences compared to the 30 years before that, uh, before 2012. And they were making the point that Proof of Heaven caused that. I don't know if Proof of Heaven uh, caused it, or if it was simply a uh, very good timing in terms of publication. But, but the fact of the matter remains that the scientific community 
is uh, greatly uh, increasing their interest and inquiry into this field of study, you know, consciousness, these exotic uh, examples of consciousness, near-death experiences, shared death experiences, uh, you know, after-death communications, uh, past life memories in children, indicative of reincarnation. These are all examples of human experiences of consciousness that completely defy the materialist model. Uh, and, you know, in many ways, uh, as a scientist, uh, you can realize that with the advent of quantum physics, materialist science really was dealt a, a death blow uh, almost a century ago. And yet it's quantum uh, physics is very kind of deeply mystifying in some sense to some people, especially if they don't realize it has anything to do with consciousness and the brain mind connection. Um, and this is where I think uh, the scientific lead will help tremendously because ultimately the beliefs of a society uh, in, in our society, at least for the last two centuries, have tend to uh, hew close towards, you know, scientific beliefs. And that's why this dominant culture of conventional scientific materialism that's not yet kind of figured out the message of quantum physics uh, has continued to dominate our uh, kind of materialist uh, press uh, and media. But I think all of that is changing. I think it's uh, starting to change quite rapidly. And that has to do uh, with the fact that uh, more and more scientists are taking all this seriously. And you're probably very well aware of the Bigelow Institute of Consciousness Studies essay contest from last year, which I would say is a catalytic game changer. Most of the world doesn't know about it yet, but all, all of your listeners should realize that the winning 29 essays for that contest that address the question, what's the best scientific evidence uh, for continuation of conscious awareness after permanent bodily death. Uh, and in that contest, they, they ended up receiving 204 winning uh, or 204 essays. All these uh, people had more than five years experience studying the afterlife questions. And I would say it sets a new high watermark for uh, establishing you know, that there's a tremendous amount of evidence when gathered by serious researchers and investigators that supports the reality of the afterlife. And not only that, I would say we're starting to get uh, make some progress in terms of theoretical models to how all this can work. You know, the primordial mind hypothesis is something uh, Karen and I discuss in detail in our book, Living in a Mindful Universe. And the more I see all of this evolving, the more I start thinking that kind of a picture uh, where we're looking at this uh, unification of mind, this kind of shared um, oneness that we all exist at in this deepest uh, kind of level of, of, of conscious awareness uh, is something that is filtered in by the brain, but that ultimately we're all deeply connected through that sense of the one mind. Uh, and I know that Pim Van Lommel's second place paper in that Bigelow Institute concert, uh, uh, contest mentions at the end of the essay, he does a beautiful job as the Dutch cardiologist who wrote that Lancet paper about NDEs in cardiac arrest patients back in 2001, but he does a beautiful job of concluding in his essay, the one mind hypothesis. And he uses as resources for that. He talks about our book, Living in a Mindful Universe. He talks about uh, Steve Taylor's book, Spiritual Science, uh, and about a paper by Bernardo Kastrup, um, on uh, the universe and consciousness. And of course, ultimately he also references Larry Dossie's beautiful book, One Mind, uh, which I, uh, I'm i a giant fan of that book. I think it's, uh, in many ways it changed my life and is changing this world about our understanding of the nature of reality. But it demands that we, we, we respect and treat each other uh, with much more dignity than we have in this crazy world of false sense of separation from materialism. Well, you're having to go in a bit, and uh, we can wrap this up. And you've answered my question, Evan, which one, a question I've had for, for a bit about what your role is in all this, because there's a bunch of us trying to develop a awareness of we got to do something different here. We got to think differently. We got to do something differently. Right. And what I what I come away with hearing your your the way you talk, being as I'm an academic uh, or recovering academic, I like to say, uh, <laughs> that you are very still academic uh, in the way you quote time and people and papers and books. And what you're doing is uh, strongly addressing the materialistic view of modern science. That looks like uh, the, the 
the badge you are wearing, the emblem you have, the spear that you're carrying, the intensity that you're that's driving you is to change the scientific community's view of reality. Well, I would say that's absolutely true. One of the reasons I wrote Proof of Heaven uh, was to awaken the medical community in particular. Now, of course, the nurses have gotten this forever. They, they know what's going on, but a lot of us doctors are a little slow on the uptake. And I was slow on the uptake. I needed a big thumping to finally get it, you know. But I, what I'd like to do is make sure other people don't have to have that same thumping, uh, you know, because the evidence is out there. I mean, if I read the book Living the Mind for Universe Before My Coma, I would absolutely get where this is headed because the facts of, of, of scientific inquiry of, you know, across the board in the many different ways of looking at consciousness are what tell us we're now aimed into a tremendous revolution, a paradigm shift in human understanding of the nature of reality. And I would say it's absolutely crucial for the very survival of our species to come into this awakening. And that's why I am such a passionate supporter of this mission uh, to help this world. I think there are billions of unborn humans who will greatly thank us <laughs> for whatever work we can do now to rescue the planet from the uh, absolute hell of materialist separation and where it's uh, driving us. Well, I see, uh, I see a team of people individually striving uh, for a similar end and right. my my role in this is very much in the regular world it's not even meditation it's certainly not psychedelics it's just everyday experience right. pay attention to meaningful coincidences because they're happening because they are another window into the higher consciousness you're talking about well absolutely and that's a beautiful gift that you're giving to the world because synchronicities meaningful coincidences are absolutely essential for us to understand more deeply our connection with the universe and our ability to influence the unfolding reality. So thanks for all that you do, Bernie. You're very welcome, Evan. And <laughs> so, I mean, it's such a pleasure to talk with you again and hear how you're evolving, to hear how you're evolving, because it's been five years and uh, more from when I first met you at, the, at DOPS. And it's wonderful to hear how you were evolving. And we're, we're teammates, really, in this, uh, in this effort. And, and I I, I'm, I'm, it's a pleasure to feel a, being a teammate with you. So Well, I agree very much. And, and you're right. I think we know a lot of the people in this world who are working on exactly this. You know, from a scientific uh, setting and the division of perceptual studies at UVA is an absolute goldmine. What they brought to this world, they've done a tremendous job. Uh, I'm very grateful to them. And I'm grateful to them, too, because they welcomed me coming from Missouri, where this wasn't exactly a popular subject. Right, right. Uh, and I could have find people also, as you did, who could understand what we're talking about. So thank you very much for being with me today, today, Eben. You're not too far away, so maybe one of these days we'll see each other. I, I, was, I was out at the White Lotus the other day, and that's not too far away from where you are. Good. We'll have to get together. We'll do that soon. Good. All right. Good. Thanks a lot, Bernie. Good talking with you, as always. You take care. Thank you, Eben. Bye-bye. This psychosphere is a mantle like a hologram of cosmic consciousness.